1 Samuel 27, let's first say a short prayer. Lord our God, uh, thank you for this word. Thank you that we can live by it and seek you through it. We pray that, Lord, we would be strengthened in our walk with you and in our love for you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Samuel 27, then David said in his heart, now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over, he and the six hundred men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Mahok, the king of Gath. And David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel, and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given me in one of the country towns that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So that day Achish gave him Ziklag. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And the number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Gershites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. For these were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as far as sure to the land of Egypt. And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Achish. When Achish asked, Where have you made a raid today? David would say, Against the Negeb of Judah, or against the Negeb of the Jeremelites, or against the Negev of the Kenites. And David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking lest they should tell about us and say, so David has done. Such was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines. And Achish trusted David, thinking, he has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel, therefore he shall always be my servant." That's 1 Samuel 27. So this, this chapter has always kind of broadsided me and puzzled me. It was David sinning in, in this. I mean, it doesn't come right out and say David was wrong to do this, but um, it just kind of strikes me as, as strange. So that was kind of the, the question that I came to as I studied this this week. So let's just start with the facts. Let's kind of go through what the text tells us. The facts are, verse 1, David thinks he will be captured. He thinks, okay, Saul's never going to give up chasing me. I should finally just get out of, out of the country, and then he'll stop seeking me. So the question there is, is David unbelieving? in thinking God will suddenly not protect him after so many times protecting him before? Or is David being prudent and not wanting to subject his wives and associates and their families to the fugitive life? Is this an act of, of uh, faithlessness or is this uh, just an act of pragmatic um, just decision making here? So he thinks this, it says he said in his heart, and then he decides to join the Philistines. So he does that in verse 2. So he joins the Philistines, and we're kind of left to wonder, is David being a traitor to his people in giving his allegiance and his taxes to his country's arch enemy? Or is David getting the best of his enemy? We're kind, of, we're kind of wondering as we're reading through here, what, what is David doing here? Um, I mean, the Philistines are, are not just, you know, the, those people in the next country that are, you know, you don't like very much. They're arch enemies. 
I mean, this is kind of like a U.S. US soldier deserting to the Taliban or something like that. This is, this is bad news. In verse 4, Saul will not contend with the Philistines to get to David. He hears that David has gone over to them, and he's like, they can have him. And he gives up going after him. So David was right in that Saul was going to give up. Um, it seems like Saul is afraid of the Philistines, and he would have good reason to be, especially as we see in the coming chapters. Uh, um, the Philistines are a very formidable enemy, and they have been throughout Saul's entire career. So Saul doesn't want to mess with the Philistines to get to David. They can have him. Um, and then David says, you know, king, um, it." It doesn't seem right that we should live in the same city as you. Is there a place in the countryside that we could have and we could just have a home base there? And he's like, yeah, sure. I'll give you this place called Ziklag. So David sets up home base away from the king. And you notice how David words that. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given me in one of the country towns and I may dwell there. For why should your servant Dwell in the royal city with you. That's uh, verse 5. He sets up his home base away from the king, which he presents it as, I'm too, I'm too lowly and humble to be in your city, your, your royal magnificent city, so I should be dwelling in one of these towns. But he has an ulterior motive here, as we, we learn later on. It's going to allow him to deceive the king. Verse 6. It says, it just makes a note here that uh, after David had Ziklag, it says, therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. So as we're reading along, we're seeing that David is gaining territory for his nation. So David is kind of functioning as the king of the country. He's gaining territory for his country. While Saul is kind of away and and useless and just only chasing after David. David's actually gaining territory. David is succeeding here. Um, and then verse 10, David lies. When Achish asked, where have you made a raid today? David would say, this place, that place, or another place. So David would lie about where he obtained all his loot. He wouldn't be honest about that. So, is, we're kind of left to wonder here, is David just lying and sinning to save his own skin? Or is he getting the best of his enemy? What, we're, we're kind of left to wonder about that. It's not like God interjects here or anything, or that the narrator interjects any commentary here. It's just reporting of what's going on. So... David lies about that. And maybe even a little more disturbing is that David wipes out everyone to protect his lie. He leaves nobody alive so nobody can go back and say, hey, David made a raid on us and not the people that he said he did. That would get David in trouble. So he just kills them all. As uh, dead men tell no tales, as it is said somewhere, that David is living by that. So, is David driving out Israel's enemies? We're kind of left to wonder that. Or is David practicing genocide so nobody would tell on him? What, what are we supposed to look at here? This is, this is it's kind of murky. Are we supposed to, how are we supposed to evaluate this? And then at the end of the chapter, we, we learn that this king, Achish, he liked David. He thinks David is making raids into his own country. He's, a, he's an Israelite attacking Israelites and raiding them. And boy, they must hate him over there. He's, he's got to be one of mine now. So King Achish was fooled into thinking that David was an ally. So... If you're just reading the story and you don't make any kind of moral or value judgments about any actions here, as the story goes, David is getting the best of the Philistine enemies, 
while Saul is being bested by them, Saul always has trouble with the Philistines and has since the beginning of his time as king. And David is getting the better of them. So David is succeeding, Saul is failing. David is gaining, Saul is losing. And you can kind of see that in the developments here. David is successfully fooling the Philistines and their leader. And uh, in coming chapters, Saul will be attacked and later defeated by the Philistines. So David is taking Saul's place here. But what you might notice is that this chapter never mentions God. God is not mentioned anywhere here. There's no mention of God or the Lord or anything of that sort. God is never consulted, never prayed to, and God does not speak or interject any comments or directions or anything like that. God is kind of just hands off, step back here. I mean, I'm not saying that God wasn't around or God forgot or God wasn't intimately involved in, in all things being sovereign, but as a person in the, the story and as it's developing, um, he's, kind of a, he's kind of not there. So as David's character goes, this is a new low for him. When you've locked with David all this way, and you've seen how he's operated, uh, this is a new low for him in a variety of ways. God doesn't interject any unfavorable analysis, and neither does the narrator, but multiple factors here show that David was not, not in the right here. David could have inquired of God, but he didn't. If you remember back in chapter 23, David was inquiring of God a lot. God was giving him direction as to whether to help these people or not, whether to uh, go in this direction or not, and God gave him victory, and God delivered him from the hand of Saul. It was great. He was constantly talking to God. David's not talking to God here. He followed his own thoughts instead of seeking God. It begins with himself thinking, and he decides to go with that. David had the priest with him and had consulted God before, but he doesn't hear. And so David says in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Did he forget how... Frequently, God had delivered him in just these recent chapters. And would he not consult God now? Um, the last time David went to the Philistines, he was recognized and found out, and he had to pretend to be insane in order to get away safely. Um, and David wrote a psalm after that. The last time in Gath, David wrote about not speaking deceit, and now he lives by it. And the last time he went to the Philistines, why don't you hit the next one there? Um, David wrote Psalm 34. And in Psalm 34, he says, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. The last time he was in Philistia, he wrote this. And now he's living by deceit. He's surviving on it. It's kind of his lifeline. He's made it that. In that same psalm, David also wrote about seeking peace, but now he lives by bloodshed. Psalm 34, a couple of verses later. Well, actually, just one verse later. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. David is going back on what he said the last time he was here. I think we're supposed to notice this and kind of scratch our heads, say, what? What happened here? Now, it's, it's a very different time back then. 
We live in nations today where we have professional armies that are constantly on alert and serving around the world and things like that. And when our country goes to war, these people step up. They're already conscripted to do so. Back then, it's a more of a primitive society and the primitive societies that are around the world today, they don't have standing armies. They are just regular artisans and craftsmen and farmers and they just pick up spears when it's time to fight. And when that is your situation, everybody's a combatant. Every, it's all hands on deck. Everybody needs to fight, even the six-year-old kids. They're out there on the battlefield with the adults. So it's a very different sort of scenario that David is in. And so for us to look at him and, and just condemn him for wiping out people, you know, it's... It's a little, it's a little short-sighted of us to do that, um, because in small-scale tribal warfare, everybody's a combatant. Everybody is. That's just the way it was. Philistia was not a nation-state; it was a series of city-states. And then there's these Gershites, these Gerizites, the Amalekites. These were tribal groups. They're not named after a place. They're named after a people group. Amalekites, not Amalek. So when tribes fight, they need everybody, and kids are raised from a young age to fight the enemy and to show no mercy, and that's just the way it is. Still, even if you factor that in, though, even so, deliberate annihilation of everybody reveals David's ruthlessness. David is ruthless here. He is deliberately, intentionally annihilating anybody. In other words, if people run away, he's not letting them get away. In most tribal warfare, if people are running the other way, you can let them get away. David is chasing down every last one so that nobody will report on him. He's ruthless here. Now, sometimes God commands annihilation, as he did with Saul, but... God isn't commanding that here. So this is all based on self-preservation. Another thing that I think we're supposed to notice as we read from the beginning of 1 Samuel to the end, David plunders the same Amalekites that Saul plundered and lost his throne over. When Saul attacked the Amalekites and plundered them, he lost his throne. David is now plundering those same people. And he's getting away with it, so to speak, at least. Now, the only difference was that Saul was under a direct order from God not to plunder them, but to destroy everything. So there is that difference there. Nevertheless, the similarities, I think, we're supposed to notice that. David is going in the same footsteps of Saul. And it's also in keeping with David neglecting God in this chapter. Saul often neglected God, and now David kind of is now. And he's walking in Saul's direction. So, <clears throat> this is... This is David's kind of one of his low points, or at least his lowest point at this up until now. Where, what are we supposed to take from this? How are we supposed to walk away from this chapter, this passage? Where is God's word to us here? Well, Christ and our salvation. I think the first thing this shows us is that even the best of us need Christ's blood and forgiveness. Even the best of us do. Um, David is kind of the salvation figure because he prefigures Christ. He's an ancestor of Christ. And so a lot of his moves are pointing ahead to Christ. Here, not so much. Um, but what we can conclude here and re be reminded of here is that even the best of us need Jesus and salvation. 
Absolutely nobody is righteous. Psalm 14, 2 and 3, David wrote that, and then the Apostle Paul quoted it later on. Both Jews and Greeks are under sin, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless, no one does good, not even one. So, David, in writing Psalm 14, he he knew that he was among those people who needed salvation, and Paul quotes that, saying, yes, even the best of us need salvation. Um, I don't have it on the screen here, but something related to this is that we can't and should not put our hope in any human being except for the perfect one. No hope in anybody, however good they might be and however confident we might be in them, we can't have our hope ultimately in another person. And when we do, we will be disappointed or led astray into doing things that are otherwise not godly. And we can see that with David here. Our salvation is not in David. He is a Christ figure in many occasions, but not here. Our hope is not in him. Our hope is in Jesus. Another thing to notice here is that God's silence here, God doesn't interject any commentary or rebuke David or anything like that. God's silence does not mean he approves. And you can see that a lot in Scripture. There's a lot of times when God doesn't intervene or interject or say, hey, that was wrong, you shouldn't have done that. Sometimes he does, but not always. So there's lots of times when God kind of is silent or steps back and just lets people do what they want in their, all of their foolishness. Um, and David here was successful, at least from human standpoint. David was successful. Our success does not mean that God approves either. Getting away with it doesn't mean it's morally good. And I think that we need to keep that in mind because I think it's human for us to think, hey, God didn't strike me dead for doing this bad thing. Maybe it's okay, or maybe he doesn't care. We can't conclude that. I think it's human nature for us to do that, but we ought not to. Sometimes God will permit us to continue in our foolishness or sin. Psalm 50, God talks in this psalm, These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. In other words, God will will give us some space to do some bad things sometimes, but that doesn't mean it's not going to catch up with us. Or that he's just going to overlook it. Um, James 4.17, I think this applies here too. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. We need to be following God's commands, even if we successfully, or at least seemingly so, get away with it. We need to do what God wants us to do, whether it seems good to us or not. And this all started because David said something in his heart and decided to follow it. And whether it was good advice or not, he should have consulted the Lord. And so it's it's striking in in this part of the story that we're only as good as our prayerful trust in God. We will fail if we are not trusting in God and we are not prayerfully seeking Him and His will and His guidance, we'll fail. We'll do awful stuff like this. We'll go in a foolish direction and maybe we'll get away with it, so to speak. But we're only as good as our trust in the Lord. So, just some uh, passages to finish with. I sought the Lord and He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. This was what He wrote the last time he was in Philistia. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. If only David would have taken his own advice, he might not have actually found himself in this mess. But we can listen and apply this 
to ourselves that we need to have our prayerful trust in the Lord instead of our own thoughts. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, um, help us to always seek you. Please prompt us, Lord, to pray when otherwise we would just rely on our own judgments or on our own thoughts. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would lead us and guide us and that, Lord, we would not um, mistake ourselves for thinking that sin is okay simply because you are being silent about it or not intervening in some way. Uh, Lord, help us to follow you and obey you always, whether it's easy or difficult, and that, uh, Lord, we would seek your will in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.